Hello and welcome to the 27th webinar of the GONE webinar series. Uh, we're really excited that she took the time to be with us here today. Uh, this is part of the Global Ocean Oxygen Network webinar series. My name is Natalia Gallo and I'm at the University of Bergen, Norse and the Bjerknes Center for Climate Research in Norway. I'll be your moderator today for today's exciting webinar. The GON Secretariat and I are very happy that you took the time to be with us and our excellent speakers. Before we start our webinar, uh, we would like to bring your attention to the Ocean Oxygen website where you can find links to past webinars, as well as the good news, the Ocean Deoxygenation Newsletter. The QR codes on the screen will take you straight there, or you can also use the URLs. So let's move on to our session. Today we have two great scientists speaking today who will share their research on how deoxygenation affects marine communities, uh, both now and in the deep past. We'll start with Martina Reusted Sulas of the University of Bergen and the Birkner Center for Climate Research and continue with Carl Redden from the Geo Center of Northern Bavaria and the Alfred Wagner Institute in Germany. Both speakers will have just under 20 minutes to present, followed by about 10 minutes of questions and answers. You can enter quest your questions in the Q&A session, which you'll see using the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom window. And you can also use the chat button to share additional information or to reach out with logistical problems. So I'll start by introducing Martina, who will be our first speaker today. Martina received her bachelor's degree in biology and her master's degree in marine biology from the University of Bergen in Norway. She is currently working on completing her PhD with a Hippon Fjordfish project at the University of Bergen, where she studies how mesopelagic organisms in fjords respond to oxygen changes. Her focus is on the vertical distribution and dial vertical migration behavior of these organisms and how they relate to environmental variables such as oxygen and light conditions. So with that, I hand over the floor to Martina. All right, uh, let's see if I can share my screen. Uh, does it work? Yeah, it looks great. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much for the uh, introduction, uh, Natalia. And thank you for everyone that is joining in today. I'm very excited to be here and to share with you some of the ongoing work in my PhD. So what I'm going to talk uh, about today is basically this fjord that we have been visiting annually since 2011 during a period of deoxygenation. And as Natalia said, I am interested in mesopelagic organisms and how they distribute according to both light and oxygen. But before I jump into my own research, let put, let's put it a bit into context. So as you probably know, our oceans are losing oxygen. And since 1960, the ocean has lost about 2% of its oxygen content. Now the oxygen loss reasons can roughly be divided into two main causes. We have global warming and eutrophication. When it comes to warming, we know that warm water can hold less oxygen than cold water. We also know that warming might lead to increased stratification that can reduce mixing of well oxygenated water with deep water. It also leads to increased oxygen demand by organisms. Eutrophication is more of an issue near the coasts where we have our industries and more direct impact of humans. So this is the nutrient accumulation that leads to an increase in algae growth. And while the algae uh, die and sink, they're decomposed by bacteria that consume oxygen in the process. Now the rate of the oxygen loss and the mechanisms behind it vary with different areas in the world and different depths and so on. But in general, these changes are happening faster than what models predict. So as a biologist, I'm interested in knowing in how this might influence marine organisms. And the organisms that I work with live in the mesopelagic zone. Now, this is an area of the ocean where only 1% of the light from the surface can reach. So it's too little light for photosynthesis, but it is enough light for those able to see in it. And here we have a variety of different organisms. 
We have small fish and crustaceans, jellyfish and squid, and many of these smaller organisms are very abundant and important prey uh, species for other taxa. In addition, many of them partake in what is referred to one of the biggest migrations on Earth, dial vertical migration. Every sunset, a large proportion of these organisms start ascending towards their surface, where they feed in the productive waters during the night. And when the sun rises in the morning, they migrate back to the deep. And if we were to view this migration using an echo sounder throughout the 24 hour period, we would see them as layers of acoustic backscatter migrating throughout the water column. And these layers are ambiguous to the world's oceans, and we also have them in the deep fjords in Norway. And by migrating up and down every single day like this, these organisms are contributing to transporting carbon from the surface to the deep, because they feed in the surface and they breathe and defecate at depth. And the efficiency of this transport depends on how deep they dive during the day and also the migration amplitude. So what affects the distribution of these organisms? We know that changes in surface light is one of the major drivers for this migration. And the light penetration of the water column can limit how deep the organisms go. The organisms are thought to have a, some sort of a light comfort zone, which is thought to optimize the trade-off between being able to see your own food, but also to avoid being spotted by predators. So in murky waters, we typically have a shallower daytime depth than we do in clear waters. And murky waters could, for example, be fjords, where the light comfort zone is further up because the light penetration is poorer. But shallower daytime depths have also been found to concur with hypoxia, where studies that have compared areas in the world with low oxygen in the deep and high oxygen in the deep find a shallower daytime depth in these low oxygen areas. That being said, the scattering layers are still found to sometimes dive deep into hypoxic and even anoxic water masses. But so it might not be oxygen directly constraining their daytime depth. And some have suggested that there might be a correlation between low oxygen water and light attenuation, where there's increased light attenuation in low oxygen water, potentially explaining the shallower daytime depth. So I'm very interested in the mesopelagic organisms and how they distribute according to light and oxygen. And maybe we can find some answers in Mossfjord, this beautiful fjord that you see on this picture. So first, a little bit about fjords. They are long and narrow inlets that are separated from the uh, coast by topographical barriers called sills. And in Masfjorden, we have a quite shallow sill around 75 meters deep in this area, while the basin of Masfjorden, which is here, is about 450 meters deep. So the connection between the basin water and the open ocean is sort of restricted by the sill. And when the sill is shallow, this can restrict it even more. And if we have longer periods of stagnant stagnation, we can get oxygen loss in the fjord. And this is what has happened between 2011 and 2018 in Mossfjorden, where at 450 meters depth, we have had a 66% reduction in dissolved oxygen. And in 2016, we reached a level of hypoxia, at least one of the thresholds for hypoxia, which means that it can influence marine life. So I'm interested in knowing how does this oxygen change influence the mesopelagic organisms that live here. Here is a picture of the main ones that we have. It's not as diverse as we have in the open ocean, which makes it a bit easier to study. And we also have other species such as deep water jellyfish, but these are the ones that mostly uh, contribute to the scattering layers. And the main contributors are the fish, the pearl side uh, Marolicus malari, and the lanternfish, Bentosima glaciale. And the way that we have studied this is by using annual student cruises that have been going to Mossfjorden in the autumn every year. And here we have ship-mounted echo sounders, CTDs for environmental variables, and trawl catch data that can help us answer some of these questions. The echo sounder send out sound that is reflected when it meets something in the water column of another density than water such as, for example, fish or the sea floor. And this can help us say something about the vertical distribution of the organisms. 
And the acoustic data in this study have been collected continuously throughout, simultaneous with other operations. For the analysis of daytime depth, we have removed data that are too close to sunrise and sunset, because this is when they migrate. And we've also avoided areas that have too um, shallow bottom depths. So here you can see how the bottom depth is changing throughout the 24 hour period with time because the ship is going back and forth in the fjord. We've also collected environmental variables such as oxygen, of course, but also things as salinity and temperature. And oxygen and salinity are part of the way that we have measured light penetration in this fjord. Because during this time period, we unfortunately don't really have light measurements in the fjord. But during an, some earlier work in my PhD, I developed a light proxy to uh, kind of uh, get an indication of light penetration, even at greater depths. So how this was done that was that we measured light attenuation using in situ light measurements in different fjords with different oxygen conditions and so on and related this to oxygen and the salinity so uh, what we found there is that light attenuation attenuation increases uh, under low salinity conditions and low oxygen conditions so low salinity we typically have at the surface where there's a lot of input from fresh water that has a lot of stuff that absorbs light and low oxygen is in the basin where it can be as a proxy for microbial degradation potentially. Also, we have some catch data to both identify what we're seeing on the echo sounder, but also to get some uh, abundance estimates of what we uh, have in the fjord. So we both have depth stratified sampling using a multi sampler at different fixed depth intervals. And we also have some deeper sampling using a trawl that don't have a net closing uh, mechanism. So this is hauled mostly in the deep, but because it can't close the net, it is also going to be somewhat influenced by catches further up as well. So now moving a bit into the results. And here's the graph that you saw earlier, the 66% reduction of oxygen between 2011 and 2018. And this is a quite quick reduction in comparison to global patterns. And moving forward, I've tried to use some colors to kind of help with the interpretation. So the high oxygen years are colored in blue, the sort of transition years are colored in purple, and then we have the low oxygen or hypoxic years in red. So during this time period, the rate and the direction of the oxygen change varies between the years and with depth. And if we look at this contour plot here, which is with all the nice colors, you can see that the main oxygen loss and the low oxygen conditions are happening beneath 300 meters depth. And if we also plot the rate of change from year to year, we get something like this. And here you can see that in 2014 and 15, we had an oxygen decline throughout the water column. And you can also here see the pattern of a renewal in 2018, where there was a partial water renewal of the basin and new and oxygen rich flowed in. So this is marked in blue. So moving on to the light penetration that was estimated from this proxy that uses salinity and oxygen to calculate light attenuation. Here, light penetration is shown on a log scale and the bluer colors are the darker conditions. And what we see is that we have some reduced light penetration in the water between 2011 and 2018. And we both have reductions in the surface waters that are likely mostly connected to changes in salinity. And these changes will, of course, also cascade further into the deep because the light has to penetrate through all these depths. But there also seems to be some changes that is driven by the oxygen loss. You can see this very steep decrease here in 2014 and 15. So if the fjord has lost oxygen and it, it is also darker in the deep, we at least would expect that the mesopelagic scattering layers will be shallower. So here is a 24 hour echogram from 2011, just showing you a bit of how uh, the scattering layer distribute. I'm not gonna go into migration strategies in this presentation, but I just wanna show you very quickly that they can vary. So you have this upper scattering layer here that migrates fully to the surface during the night. And you have this second scattering layer that partially migrates to the surface, but it also stays at depth during the night. And also we had scatterers in the deep 
that didn't really show any sign of a clear synchronized migration to the surface. And also based on previous knowledge and our own troll catches from 2011, we know that the upper scattering layers is mostly dominated by pearl side. The second one also has a lot of pearl side, but also bentosema is in the deeper part of the scattering layer. And below 250 meters depth, we mostly have uh, the glacier lanternfish, the bentosema glaciale. So this is how I plotted daytime depth. So you can see that this peaks where the majority of the scattering is going on. So this is the mean for the whole cruise. And you can see that the peaks align well with the echogram that you see to the side. And for the well oxygenated years, we basically have two main scattering layers above 250 meters depth. And we also have increased uh, backscatter below 300 meters. And these were the years where there were well oxygenated waters and light penetration was also quite good. And then we have 2014 and 15, where the fjord started to lose oxygen and it also started to become darker. There is still two scattering layers going on, but we can see that we've lost almost all the scatter at 300 meters depth and deeper. For the low oxygen years, that is technically still quite dark as well we can see that the strength of the two upper scattering layers seem to vary a bit more. And we can see that there is a return of scatterers below 300 meters depth. So if you look at the model in comparison, you can see that uh, if you compare the first two and the last two, there seems to have been some changes happening in the fjord. And a lot of the changes are happening above 300 meters depth, which is above the main oxygen decline. But let's then dive a bit deeper into the place where the oxygen is declining, which is below 300 meters depth. So this is a slightly different plot. Now the scattering strength is on the y-axis, and the different lines are different depth intervals. The, uh, the brown ones are the deepest ones. So for the well-oxygenated years with good light attenuation, a good light penetration, we have a high abundance of scatterers. And the majority is found deeper than 400 meters. And uh, for the uh, later years where it's becoming darker in the water column, we can see that the scatters are disappearing. So maybe this means that their light comfort zone has moved sort of out of this area and the scatters are found deeper, sorry, shallower, that they moved shallower. But then we have this uh, next period where it's still relatively dark, but it seems to and have an increase in scatterers again. So there's a high abundance in both 2016 and 17, where there's low oxygen and relatively dark, but the majority of the scatterers are slightly um, shallower than what they were in the well oxygenated years. After the water renewal in 2018, they seem to go slightly deeper. And what is interesting is that the deeper they are going is actually to the place where it is still some hypoxic conditions. But it is a bit difficult to say whether they're actually maybe attracted to hypoxia as a predator refuge, or whether this change that we're seeing in 2018 is more driven by an improvement in the light penetration of the fjord. So moving on to the catches that we have, um, these are just for the pearl side and the lanternfish. And you can see that after 2014, we have a decline in the abundance of Marolicus mulleri. And this is both for the uh, depth stratified sampling that I've just put together to get an indication of the abundance, and also from the deep holes that we have. For Bantosema, the it seems to be slightly more stable or even an increase if we look at this change from 2016 to 17. So, it doesn't really seem to be that affected by what is going on in the fjord. What is relevant to know is that Marolicus mulleri is mostly distributed above where we had the ma main oxygen loss. But this is also a species that is quite sensitive to light changes, and it lives at much brighter environments than what Bentosema do. So it might be that the reduction in light penetration in the fjord is the main cause driving this relationship. Bentosema, which is adapted to more dark conditions and uh, maybe also tolerant of hypoxia, might do just fine with the changes that are happening in the fjord. And another thing that is relevant to mention for this period of time that I haven't mentioned yet is that these two are potentially also getting another competitor in the fjord. 
because during this time period, we've seen an, a very clear increase of the deep water jellyfish, Periphyla periphyla. This is a jellyfish that really likes dark conditions. And we have some really dark fjords in Norway where we just have this one and almost no mesopelagic fish. So it is also in a way a potential sign that the fjords are getting somewhat darker. But now trying to pull some uh, conclusions out of all of this. Uh, in general, we don't really see any clear evidence of hypoxia avoidance in Mossfjorden. Um, it might, in a way, function as a predator refuge. But what is also relevant to know is that the Bentosima glaciale, uh, the lanternfish that thrive at these depths, might also be quite tolerant of low oxygen conditions. In addition, the oxygen conditions we have here are not really extremely low in comparison to other places in the world. So it might not be that much of an issue for these organisms. But simultaneously with the uh, oxygen loss, we seem to have had a darkening of the fjord or a reduction in light penetration. And this seems to have maybe caused some changes in the sketching layer strength and depth above the main oxycline. It might also be the driver for the decrease in abundance of the pearl side, because, uh, because we didn't see any negative trend for the lanternfish, which might be more tolerant of darker conditions and poorer oxygen conditions. And we also have this increase in the deep water jellyfish, periphyla, periphyla. So lastly, I want to say that uh, this work is not really able to fully disentangle the correlations between light and oxygen that we have seen in previous works. And we've just used a proxy that is driven by either salinity or oxygen. And, but we do know that the optic environment is very important for these organisms. So I would encourage anyone that works with mesopelagic fish and in the mesopelagic to, if possible, get in situ light measurements so we in the future can better understand what is driving their daytime depth and vertical distribution. Lastly, I just want to acknowledge the funders of this Hippon Fjord Fish project and thank everyone that I'm working with in this project. And also thank you all so much for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Martina, for that presentation. Um, really interesting and just really goes to show how complicated uh, the interpretation of ecological patterns are. Um, and that, you know, sometimes we don't find as clear of trends to hypoxia um, and deoxygenation as we might expect uh, to find. Um, and that, yeah, it's important to consider co-varying stressors as well um, that kind of additionally complicate interpretations. Um, so thank you so much for sharing those perspectives and those results from your PhD. Um, so I have one question here that we'll start with from Barbara Frank. Uh, she says, do you also have data on how oxygen concentrations have developed since 2019? Thank you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we do. Um, so uh, that is kind of, I guess, the next chapter of all of this, because uh, that is also very interesting. Um, but the thing is, after 2019, in 2021, actually, we had a deep water renewal in or in in Mossfjorden. So the whole basin water basically got new and oxygen rich water into the basin. Um, and this has to do with density changes and you need northerly winds to kind of push the water and upwelling uh, to, to sort of all should work together. So we have a very interesting change there as well, where we have a sudden, very steep increase in oxygen. Uh, so yes, that is kind of the next chapter that maybe I can present in another uh, another time, maybe. But uh, there there might be some interesting things to do, get from that as well. Thank you. So I'll move on to Veronique Garçon's question next. Uh, is the change in light attenuation due to changes in river inflow and sea dom around the fjord? Yes. So that is uh, a very good question. Um, now, first of all, this is a proxy that is based on these measurements that I, I did uh, in 2019 and 20 and, and, and 2021. And um, for the salinity sort of is, is kind of the, the proxy that we get for this fresh water inputs and, and terrestrial dissolved organic matter that we get from, from rivers and so on. So that is um, definitely part of, of, of driving that relationship. 
Um, and I guess there's been seen, you know, browning of fresh water uh, on land, and there's this coastal water darkening that seems to be going on around the Norwegian coast. So, so definitely it's likely that it's driven by this, this freshwater input. And um, dissolved organic matter is also what we think might be the case in the, in the low oxygen conditions. So we have this anoxic fjord um, where we were able to get some estimates of, of dissolved organic uh, matter. And that seemed to increase very steeply with the low oxygen conditions in, in that fjord. Thank you. Then uh, we'll move on to Daria Bedulina's question. Is anything known about the hypoxia tolerance of these two fish species? So um, mctophids or elantin fishes in general, I believe are quite well adapted to uh, low oxygen conditions. And I think they have relatives in the, in the Red Sea, I think that can stay in very low oxygen conditions. I think it, and some I'm not going to say it for certain because I don't <laughs> remember all the species within this genus, but I mean, some of them can say almost in anoxic conditions during the day. So at least the lantern fishes, I believe, are pretty tolerant to oxygen loss. When it comes to the pearl side, the Morolicus malari, I haven't found uh, much literature on that one specifically. So I don't know uh, that uh, yet, <laughs> at least. Um, but it's also quite uh, shallow. Um, so, but yeah, I, I, I don't know for that one, at least. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so then we'll move on to Muriel Dunn's uh, question. Um, first, uh, you're thanked for your presentation. Uh, as others have noted in the chat, it was a very nice presentation. Um, so Muriel asks, do you think the deep backscatter could be related to the deep water jellyfish? And what do you expect to be the impact of the increased jellyfish on the mesopelagic fish? Excellent question. Uh, so the increase in backscatter in the, or the, in the deep is likely not this deep water jellyfish. Uh, the, within the echo, like, I guess fisheries acoustics, you can use different frequencies to study different organisms and so on, and, and use the com comparison between frequencies to get an indication of what the species are and, and so on. But at the frequency that we are using, or the echo sounder we're using, the uh, jellyfish likely don't give off a very strong signal and will probably be swamped by the signal from the fish. They can give off a signal at this frequency, but you then have to threshold a bit differently and you if you, if there's no fish, you might pick up a signal, basically. And as for the um, increase in jellyfish, I would think that it could at least cause some competition for food, uh, but also in general, in these uh, fjords where there's so much of them, it might also just be that it's just too dark for, for mesopelagic fish, because mesopelagic fish are visual predators, while these jellyfish are tactile predators. They don't need to see that much, which is why they do so well in darkness. And they also probably do well under low oxygen conditions. So it is probably a, a, a bit of a competitor to work with. <laughs> yeah, great. One uh, technical question from, for you from Lani Maluleke. Uh, mm -hmm. She asks, what programming language, if any, did you use to analyze and interpret your data and results? I'm using R. Uh, for the analysis and, and the illustration and, and everything. But I know that for to make these echograms and acoustic, um, in acoustic data are very <laughs> huge sometimes. So I know a lot of people use MATLAB, uh, but I've just used R. Excellent. And uh, one question from Carl, actually, before we move on to his presentation. Um, so he is asking about the longer term context of these changes. Um, it, he's asking if you could speak to um, whether there are any natural cycles of oxygenation and deoxygenation in the fjord that may be linked to things like the Atlantic Oscillation. So the decrease in, in oxygen that we're seeing seems to be part of a multidecadal kind of decrease in, in, in general that is connected to, to warming that increases stratification and that might reduce the renewal rate of these fjords. So that is, I guess, one answer to your question. I don't know if it fully answers the question. Uh, but yeah, there. I mean, the, I, if we get warmer water and less renewal and so on, this will probably lead to more oxygen loss in the fjords. And we're already seeing that moss fjord is steeply decreasing again. So we'll see when the next renewal will happen. <laughs> 
Uh, great. Well, I think with that, um, we will uh, change gears and move on to Carl's presentation. And if there's time, we have one more question from Elva that we can return to at the end um, about the light attenuation proxy that she used. Um, or uh, you could also, we could follow up afterwards about that. So uh, without further ado, we'll move on to our next speaker, Carl Redden. Uh, so Carl did his PhD in spatial patterns and intertidal biodiversity at Queen's University in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and used analytical methods as a pivot to work on deep time extinction patterns in response to climate change with the Geocentrum Nord Bayern uh, uh, Center in Erlangen, as well as the Museum for uh, Naturkunde in Berlin. And now he's at the Alfred Wegener Institute and all of these places have been in Germany. Um, and his research interests are in crossing the ecological paleontological gap, especially in relation to impacts of climate change on marine ectotherms. So without further ado, um, I really look forward to hearing your presentation, Carl. Thank you very much. And your time. slides look great. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're up, good. <laughs> um, thank you for the presentation as well, Mattia. That was fantastic. Um, so I hope I can follow up half decently. Um, so yeah, good afternoon from North Germany. Um, I'll present some of my work that um, was in the early stages during the Kiel Ocean Deoxygenation Conference back in 2018, that some of you may remember. And the background, of course, is, and I'll skip a little bit of this to avoid repetition, um, we know that climate is changing and that has knock-on effects on various different um, environmental factors, including uh, seawater uh, oxygen levels. And I want to focus on, a little bit on the tropics here. Um, the conditions in the tropics are maybe particularly challenging. Uh, the tropics have high climate velocities, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, they already have low oxygen concentrations. Um, but then additionally to that, they are host to um, relatively high oxygen loss as well, as you can see in the bottom right. So a big question is how did the Earth system cope in the past and how did marine organisms respond back then to those deoxygenation events? And how can we make use of that information uh, to, to predict the future potentially? So firstly, what do we know about deoxygenation through time? This is outside my expertise, so I'll just present a summary. Um, so here on this plot, we have a, the time bar from about 250 million years ago to 40 million years ago. And you can see two curves, one of temperature and one of carbon isotopes, which is summarizing kind of changes in the global carbon cycle. And both are showing uh, spikes around when we have large igneous province increased volcanic activity, which are also um, hosting uh, ocean deoxygenation events as well. So we have lots of correspondence of these uh, patterns around these hyperthermal events, these rapid global warming events, which I'll come back to, which are heralded as potential analogs for the future. So how would we um, expect uh, fossil organisms to respond? Now, I'm going to flip back and forward between kind of modern and uh, fossil responses. So I hope not to make you too seasick, but to hope to um, help you a little bit. I'll put either a fossil fish in the top right corner or a modern uh, fresh fish in the top right corner. So just so you can get your bearings a little bit. So we're gonna go back to the modern or forward to the modern time to um, get an idea about how organisms respond to uh, climate change, especially uh, ocean deoxygenation. Um, organisms have thermal performance curves, uh, which is just a simplification of their thermal niche. And um, with an optimum temperature around the center of that curve and the, the curve then going down into upper and lower pages and critical temperatures. And when we add additional stresses such as deoxygenation or, or elevated carbon dioxide, then this um, thermal performance curve gets con constricted and mechanisms that have been suggested to, uh, to, to make this happen include the oxygen and capacity th limitation of thermal tolerance, the OCLTT mechanism. So we can validate mechanisms by testing the agreement between um, the part, well, sorry, I should pick that up, between laboratory experiments and real world observations. Uh, so, and those can include the deoxygenation and its interaction with warming, which is what I'll um, focus on. 
In brief, I'll also mention a perhaps more famous meta-analysis, and then I'll talk about how our results are on another meta-analysis um, on the interaction between oxy deoxygenation and warming can complement uh, this entire picture that's building. So first off, um, another meta-analysis, Sam Pao et al. in 2021 showed that the effects of ocean deoxygenation are understudied. They covered several major taxa and used predefined levels of climate-related stresses to, um, to identify studies that are of interest to them. They then used hierarchical meta-analysis to show that a mean negative uh, effect size over all uh, stressor combinations was present but that this was significantly more negative for, hypo for the responses of organisms to hypoxic events. And they suggested that more work should be targeted at the impacts of hypoxic events. Um, I'll, over to our meta-analysis, I'll go into a little bit more detail with this one, of course, because I just know it better. Um, so like before, I'll present the general performance results. So, that is just a summary over all of the different types of responses, such as metabolism and growth and calcification. But we covered lots of different uh, response types, uh, life stages and major clades, uh, as you can see on this top right figure. Unfortunately, some of these were, we had too few species per clade to make any specific inference about um, some of those clades. We prioritized multiple stressor experiments. So these uh, tended to be the least uh, studied apart from the interaction between warming and acidification. And we permitted climate related stressor studies to, that, that went, basically went to any realistic future um, condition for the organism's um, distribution as qualified by the authors of those uh, experimental papers. So this was quite different to Sam Pao et al, who had different uh, qualification criteria. We also set the organism's responses in an estimation of their thermal niche. So whether the, the uh, warming was too closer to the thermal optimum or above the thermal opt optimum. And we used uh, the standard inverse variance weighted mixed effect meta-analysis. Over to the results. So like before, we have performance on the y-axis and all the climate related stressor uh, categories on the x-axis organized into single stressors and combined stresses up to where three stresses are being manipulated all at once, the TRIO um, category. So steps in the analysis to avoid potential publication bias meant that this took a more conservative estimate of responses. Uh, but nevertheless, I'd like to just pick out the, um, the, the combination of uh, warming and hypoxia were clearly the worst of these uh, combinations, which is um, also a uh, syn and a synergy between these two stresses as their this effect size is far outside this region of additivity, this yellow box. When we, um, if we drop the studies that warm to beneath a species thermal optimum, this consistently also makes the responses more, ne more negative across the, ver the varying uh, stressor combinations as shown by these um, orange points. And if we focus on the synergy between combined warming and deoxygenation with using a meta-regression, uh, we can see that it's the low uh, latitude populations which uh, showed a particularly deleterious response to this uh, combination of related stresses. Unfortunately, this is one of the least studied regions um, in, uh, in regard to experimental uh, responses of modern organisms. Uh, and I'll come back to these low latitudes in a little bit. Now, the main purpose of our meta-analysis was to quantify differences among taxonomic groups and compare that with taxonomic uh, differences in taxonomic groups in the extinction record in fossils. So, of course, one issue we had to jump over was that um, when we make modern fossil comparisons, fossil species are generally extinct. Uh, but we can average responses to the higher clades, which were both alive back then and still up and are still now. For example, the, the bivalve order of, or family of uh, pectini, pectin, pectinidae. So bottom left, we have clade modern response effect sizes from experiments of climate-related stresses. And we have, and in the top right, we have the overall extinction risk patterns through the fossil record. 
And when we order clades by their, either by their mean climate related stressor tolerance or their mean genus survival odds through the fossil record, and then use a ranked, a weighted rank correlation, then we, it gives us a plot like this. And you can see that there's a decent correlation between the, the, these two measures of, um, of tolerance. So although there are a few points plotted here, each point represents a lot of data. For example, modern effect sizes are represented here by at least five species per clade. So you've got thing, uh, things like gastropods and oysters emerging as climate-related stressor tolerant in the top right. And so they're having uh, high fossil survival odds through time and um, low climate-related stressor uh, performance change. Things like uh, fishes and brittle stars are at the other end of this uh, gradient. Now, one outlier here could be the, the mitilid bivalves. These seem to be to have especially um, harsh experimental conditions, mainly because of, because of their, their habitat being in the intertidal, or the, at least the experimented upon organisms. So here the clade extinction risk was simply the average through time, but what if we picked out the times of rapid warming and had a look at the extinction risk of the organisms then. So in other words, these hypothermal events. So the first thing to do then would be to objectively define which events were, are these hypothermal events in the back, in, in the fossil record. Uh, but thankfully, another study had already done this uh, based on several criteria, such as geologically rapid tropical warming of greater than two degrees and widespread anoxia. So all that was left was to calculate the deviation of extinction responses during hypothermals from the usual extinction response through time. And how does this affect that correlation that I showed you on the previous slide when we really focus on uh, hypothermal events? So that previous value was, was the average extinction risk across time, but, if, but we can get a correlation value between that, that represents this comparison between modern and fossil agreement uh, in performance responses, um, we can get a correlation value for each geological age. And if we average the, what, those geological ages that represent hypothermal events, then you get the, a Spearman's rank row that looks like on this, on this figure here with this red uh, effect size and the 95% the confidence intervals around it. So we can see that this correlation increases if we focus on the hypothermal events. So given the tentative success with that approach, we decided to extend it a little bit. Um, so this continued using logistic regression to calculate the difference in extinction rate among groups, for example, uh, clades. And then we could compare a group's hypothermal extinction risk against its kind of typical extinction risk over all the non-hypothermal times. And this has the theory that if an organism group is more vulnerable to warming than another group, than most groups, then it should show a deviation from that group's uh, normal response in terms of extinction risk. So first I'll compare extinction risk by um, an organism's thermal habitat. So in other words, comparing organisms that live in warm water from organisms that live in cooler waters. So how unique and consistent are hypothermal extinction responses by their thermal habitat? The fossil record suggests raised extinction odds in warm and in cold water habitat with a kind of a lower extinction odds in, in temperate habitats in immediate kind of intermediate temperature uh, water habitats. We also found made a simulation of a simple mechanism to explain this, which was based on species stochastically following their thermal niche on a sphere and found that essentially what could be happening is that the, when, when we warm and the, the oxygen levels of the water go down and the, their thermal niches contract, so basically the polar organisms are being pushed off, the, off into the poles where their habitat area just um, goes to absolute zero. And um, tropical organisms that are used to very large, uh, potentially very large areas, as they move uh, polewoods, they encounter a sudden relative bottleneck in habitat area. So they also increase their rate of extinction. So temperature, uh, 
dependent oxygen limitation is likely to just further cont uh, const constrain habitat area. So it's probably one of the reasons why um, this response to thermal habitat area change is so clear in the fossil record. Um, past observations of warm water extinctions under warming agree with with the modern with modern observations of marine species in equatorial regions over the warming of the last uh, few decades. So this uh, approach allows us to pick out the individual hypothermal event contributions to the average. Um, so I won't go into this slide too much, but it just allows us to pick out that the end Permian mass extinction here uh, labeled by its stage name, the Chang Xingyin, um, is a bit of an outlier in terms of the, the genus, genus extinction risk um, by their uh, thermal preferred thermal habitat. So it suggests that that uh, particular um, hyperthermal might be a bit problematic to use as, as an, an out analog for the future. So that was organisms risk by, based on their thermal habitat, but what about other traits thought to influence uh, organism risk under climate change? So here I'll focus on uh, risk expectations associated specifically with ocean de deoxygenation. So using the same approach as before, so calculating extinction selectivity uh, via logistic regression, and then looking at the differences between rapid warming times and normal times. And if there was no mean difference between uh, rapid warming times and normal times, the, the, the point for that particular group of organisms and their confidence intervals would fall around zero, uh, which would just represent that the organism doesn't really care whether it's a hyperthermal or some other kind of extinction event in the past. So the individual events are labeled by the symbols at the bottom of the screen there, if you're interested. And um, if we get a effect size to the right of zero, we, this indicates a greater, a an increase in vulnerability during hypothermal events. So firstly, you can see here, larger body sized organisms um, become more vulnerable than usual during hyperthermals. And this meets, fits the expectations that they become more vulnerable to temperature dependent uh, deoxygenation. This was the case even within the more uh, hyperthermal tolerant bivalves. And then over on the right hand side, our approach also suggested that more mobile organisms become more vulnerable to extinction than usual during hyperthermals, more vulnerable to extinction during hyperthermals than usual. So this questions whether organisms with a greater aerobic scope really can better tolerate uh, long term warming and deoxygenation. However, this uh, was not the case within ancient bivalves. In all cases, stationary organism risk did, did not change at hyperthermal events. Uh, finally, contrasting marine organisms by their diet. Uh, so fossil differences between rapid warming and normal times um, on the right here. So I should flip, put up these fish again. Uh, deposit feeders are standing out as significantly more vulnerable than usual as well. Uh, so this, if we, we can also compare this with experimental responses of deposit feeders via meta-analysis again, and this, these uh, experimental responses also agree that deposit feeders are vulnerable. So this seems to be a result that was picked up by some modelers, Crichton et al, that warming and reduced seafloor oxygenation may sway resource competition among deposit feeders away from metazoans and more towards prokaryotes. The more likely to rely on O2 on oxygen diffusion um, as a means of delivering oxygen to their respiring tissues. Cool. Um, and so that's uh, that's my slides. Apart from my conclusions, so um, I would just like to conclude that warming and deoxygenation are a likely major driver of population loss. Uh, they were likely in the past, they are already, and they so they likely will be in the future. Climate-related stresses, especially warming and deoxygenation, may drive scale and variant responses where performance loss at the even individual scale may scale up to global extinction risk eventually. Um, when we do experiments, the impact should be uh, expected or the expectation should be relative to, to the context of an organism's thermal niche. 
and hypoxia and its combinations with other climate related stresses, especially uh, trios of stresses, are chronically understudied, as are many clades, such as brachiopods and cephalopods, and equatorial and cold water organisms as well. Uh, during hypothermal events, uh, rapid warming and deoxygenation squeezes species distributions in warm waters. Uh, energetic strategies are likely to change, such as increased risk for large body sized organisms, um, more energetic lifestyles and metazoan deposit feeders. And um, thankfully, uh, modern phys physiological studies um, appear useful to assess the extinction drivers during the ancient mass extinctions. And conversely, ancient responses may also inform us of future responses. So thank you very much for listening. These are my references. And I'd like to thank my co-authors who made this work possible. So I've just highlighted them in the um, reference list there. So that's me done. Uh, thank you so much, Carl. That was really interesting um, and so nice to hear the perspective from kind of modern uh, community and organismal responses all the way to the responses of uh, these organisms and communities in deep time during these hyperthermal events. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing that research. Um, if you have questions, please add them to the Q&A. Uh, and I will start with the two that have already come in. So the first from Veronique Garçon, she says, what is uh, your definition of performance response? Um, used it in slide eight and following uh, performance and doing which biological or physiological process? Sure, so um, in our uh, meta-analysis, we um, collected lots of different uh, performance responses. So apologies that I, yeah, I've just kind of summarized them as performance responses, but they could include things like growth, uh, calcification, um, whether the organism could home in on its on its preferred habitat as a, as a larvae. Um, and then we took, we used um, standardized um, mean uh, effect size, standardized effect sizes to kind of like bring all of these different responses that have different units into the same um, comparable statistical framework as is kind of common for meta-analyses. So yeah, we, I don't have it, uh, we didn't focus on any particular performance response, but gathered the overall um, impact on the organisms over lots of different performance responses. Thank you. Um, so Elva has a, Elva Escobar has a question for you. Uh, can synergies of pollutants with warming, deoxygenation and acidification have a similar response as the hyperthermal? Yeah, that's the that's the big question um, that we're trying to kind of answer. So, yeah, like when we do when we do experiments over much shorter kind of human uh, time scales, maybe like weeks, months, even years, does that really scale up to these extinction responses? Because of, of course, like from when an organism uh, responds as an individual, it that as you aggregate those responses to the population level, to the ecosystem level, there's a, hell, a heck of a lot of complexity which uh, comes in. So we really, that's the, the, the million dollar question really, it's like, do these uh, responses scale up from very simple um, uh, situations into the, the extremely complex situation of the, of the entire globe and the biome? So yeah, thank these you. Are really great question, questions. Yeah, and they're, they're continuing to come in. So uh, your talks definitely generated uh, some interest. Um, and yeah, um, so we've got the next question from Daria Bedulina and she says, does the rate or the speed of warming matter for the extinction of different groups of organisms? It's nice that you kind of have these different hyperthermals that uh, occur uh, with different rates of change. And so maybe you can actually answer that question. <laughs> Yeah, that's a real tough one to answer, um, and I'm sure she'll know. Um, uh, so I guess you can answer that on two different time frame, time scales. You can answer it on the modern time scale, where we know that the rate of warming is important for whether an organism can tolerate it or not. And the magnitude of warming, um, you, the organism can cope with different magnitudes of warming depending on how long that magnitude is, is held for. Um, on the fossil side, 
um, looking at rates of change is really difficult. Um, and there's a lot of great work going into trying to kind of go from where we know the rates of change affect uh, organisms and scaling that up through different kind of type temporal resolutions up to the fossil record. So we expect there to be a, an important, a, a important role of rate of change, but the deep time fossil record makes it quite difficult for us to access the information on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so another question from Elva, uh, how does vulnerability increase in relation to number and extent of larval stages? Oh, I, yeah, yeah I, great, great question. Um, I, that's, I think I can't answer that one um, just because of my speciality, but um, from what I've read based on some, maybe some of the work of some people in the, in the audience here, is that uh, the hypothesis is that um, the, la the, the, the lower, the larval stage, uh, the spawners and the, and the very earliest larvae are expected to be kind of like some of the most uh, greatest hit impacted by a warming and deoxygenation. Um, so a question from Barbara Frank, who belongs to the deadly trio? Is there one combination that can be defined? Um, we didn't restrict it to any particular combination. Um, there are some studies that have used the deadly trio to, um, in reference to yeah, warming, deoxygenation, and acidification. Um, but yeah, in our experiment, in our meta-analysis, we also included salinity changes. Um, so a deadly trio could include a salinity change um, away from a, an organism's salinity niche, if you like. Thank you. And then uh, just one last follow up to Veronique's previous question, I think. Um, she is asking in terms of the performance responses you used, what you did if there were antagonistic performance responses, how you handled that. For example, if you saw negative uh, trends for growth, but not for calcification, how did you weigh those responses together uh, in your performance indicators? We, um, so the work, yeah, there was there was if, I, if my slides are are still showing you like there was um, a an average um, an antagonistic or well, there was several antagonistic um, responses just where the 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 performance response um, is to is above this region of additivity, um, but gen generally if there was evidence in the, in of of antagonism in the experiments then we just allowed that through into our overall statistics. Um, I'm not sure if that's answered the, the question, um, but yeah, please do write me if, um, if you mean something different. Okay, well, thank you so much, Carl, uh, both for your presentation and for uh, handling all of those questions. Um, we had two really, really excellent uh, talks today. So thank you to both of the speakers um, for sharing their research with all of us today. Um, I will take back the screen from you for a second, uh, just to finish up here. Um, okay, so hopefully now you can see uh, the screen. Um, and uh, first of all, we'd like to thank everyone who joined us today. Um, and we'd like you to know that our next webinar is going to be in March, so please join us. Uh, you can also find out more on our social media channels in the meantime, and this presentation will also be made available on YouTube later, along with all of the other webinars. Um, and you can find out more information and sign up for our other activities for World Ocean Day in June 2024. So have a pleasant day or night wherever you're connecting with us, um, and thank you so much for your time. We'll see you next time. Bye.